Hello. Welcome to this second activity in the for loops chapter of Learn to Code. Uh, we're working on the looping all, si all the sides activity. Looping all the sides activity. Uh, before we get started with our activity uh, solving uh, a puzzle for byte, I wanted to take a little minute here to talk about a high performance computing application that uses for loops. Um, we mentioned last time that one of the things computers do best is uh, given some for loop it will execute a sequence of commands over and over and over again really quickly. That type of activity is most prevalent in high performance computing applications and one of the great examples of this is making a weather forecast. Um, turns out making a weather forecast is a very difficult uh, activity and it takes even the very best supercomputers that we have available to us several hours three or four times a day to uh, make our weather forecasts. Uh, so how is this done? Well uh, it's really not that complicated it's just something that takes very fast computers lots and lots of executions in a for loop to solve the problem. Uh, and what, what we do as atmospheric scientists is if you look at the, uh, this uh, model of the Earth in the upper right hand corner here, uh, in fact we've got a model of the Earth's atmosphere, this gray, this gray sphere that's uh, enveloping the Earth here. Um, what we do is we, we divide the atmosphere up both in the east-west direction and in the north-south direction into thousands of uh, squares. And then we also divide the atmosphere in the vertical direction so that really now we have thousands of like cube-like shapes. Okay, so the atmosphere ends up being divided up into these cube-like shapes. Now, inside these cube-like shapes, we can say, you know, if we want to keep track of the temperature and say the moisture content, the water vapor content in each one of these cubes, uh, well, it's really just a simple uh, matter of uh, executing some math problems, uh, w one set of math problems on each one of these cubes. So if we're looking at this cube, for example, right here, well, uh, what we might want to do in our math problems is say we're going to calculate maybe how much sunlight enters that cube and how much energy goes into that cube from the sun. And that can vary by um, how reflective the Earth's surface is at that point. If it's shiny and white like a frozen lake or snow cover, it'll reflect a lot of sunlight back. If it's dark like an ocean or a fertile farmland, it will absorb a lot of that sunlight and that will heat up that cube a little bit more. Um, and then, so those are some energy inputs that go into that cube, but also it may get some uh, warming or cooling depending on the uh, cubes adjacent to it. For example, if the wind is blowing from a warmer direction, that might blow some extra heat into the cube you're worrying about, and that needs to be factored into your math problems. Now, uh, same thing goes for moisture. We'll keep track of how much moisture gets added either from winds around it, carrying moisture in or out from adjacent, um, adjacent uh, cubes, or uh, another way might be evaporation. If there's a moist soil or lake or ocean underlying that cube, you may get moisture um, evaporating over that. So let's say we're making a forecast for oh, 10 minutes into the future. We know what the temperatures are now uh, at each one of these cubes, and we want to know what it is 10 minutes in the future. Well, we're just going to run a big for loop over all these cubes. And inside that for loop, we're going to execute the math equations, the math problems that determine whether, you know, how much sunlight enters the cube, how much, um, how much, uh, heat and moisture gets transported in or out of the cube from surrounding cubes. Uh, we'll also calculate in those math equations 
how much uh, how the wind changes based on forces from outside the outside the cube okay so uh, anyway that's how this goes and it, it happens over and over and over again meaning that this for loop executes that same set of math uh, problems uh, determining how much heat and moisture and wind uh, changes there are in that 10 minutes for every one of these thousands of cubes across the atmosphere okay and that's just to get a forecast for 10 minutes from now when we get to want to know what the next 10 minutes are we have to do it all over again and 10 minutes after that we do it all over again so there's another for loop that uh, that controls the amount of time that we're making our forecast for. If we, you know, can only determine the the changes every 10 minutes and we want to know the forecast for three days from now, well, we're going to have to run a very long for loop uh, that goes through every 10 minutes to, uh, you know, calculate uh, the changes in temperature and wind speed uh, each, each 10 minutes for that whole three-day duration. So anyway, there's a lot that goes in into this, a lot of computing, and uh, I'll just co show you a nice result here of what it looks like when we have um, one of these forecasts made. Here's, for example, if we unwrap that atmosphere and we look at the, um, this is the amount of moisture in each one of these small cubes uh, laid out in a rectangle here, and it's, it's an animation showing um, uh, you know, several days worth here, actually about a month's worth of, of um, water, water vapor uh, in the atmosphere uh, from one of these high-performance weather models, they're called. And you can see the winds blowing the uh, the winds blowing the, the moisture uh, around from one place to another. You can see how there's more moisture in the tropics right along the equator. There's much less. Uh, water vapor up near the poles, both the north and south poles, and in the middle where a lot of people live, in the middle between the equator and the poles, we call them the middle latitudes, uh, there's some serious storms where uh, the atmosphere is trying to balance out all that heat at the equator and the cold temperatures at the poles, and you get a lot of spinning and mixing of the atmosphere in that area, and that's what we call our day-to-day -day weather. So anyway, uh, a very nice animation, we call this a computer visualization of some of this weather model output. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed that. Now let's get to the, uh, let's get to the puzzle. Okay, in this puzzle, and again, we're working on the second puzzle in the for loops chapter of Learn to Code. The goal is to use a for loop to repeat a sequence of commands. And uh, we've got a sequence of commands given to us here. A move forward, collect gem, move forward, move forward, move forward, and turn right. So let's go ahead and run this sequence of commands and watch what byte does here. So as we go along, here's our move forward, collect gem, three move forwards, move forward, move forward, move forward, and a turn right. Okay? Now, uh, there are still three more gems to go, and it looks like to get this gem, uh, we need to move forward, collect gem, move forward, move forward, move forward, and then turn right again to get ready for the next row. So that's the same exact sequence of commands we have here. Okay, then let's look at the next after we turn right. We're going to want to do a move forward, collect gem, Move forward, move forward, move forward, and turn right again. Again, this same sequence of commands. And finally, on the back row, again, it's the same set where we're going to move forward, collect gem, move forward, move forward, move forward, turn right. We'll get us all set to do the puzzle again if we needed to. So um, if we do this same sequence of commands four times, we will complete the puzzle. Okay, sounds like the perfect job for a for loop. So the way we're going to do this here is uh, let's start above our sequence of commands here and let's either start typing the word for or tap down in the shortcut bar here. Uh, uh, let's type the word for. And notice that uh, the Playgrounds here, uh, Swift Playgrounds, uh, does this nice job of filling in all the code for our for loop. 
So if we forget what the syntax is for a for loop, it'll have it all in here for us. So again, just to remind ourselves from last time, the syntax is we say for i in a sequence 1 dot 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 up to some ending number, which tells us in this case if the starting number is 1, we're going to want to go up to 4 because that will be the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, four different numbers, four different times we will execute this sequence of commands. Okay. Now, uh, we uh, have a little bit of a problem here because our code is down here, and we actually want this sequence of commands to be the body of our for loop. We want the sequence of commands to be right in here. So we could copy and paste or cut and cut this, cut this uh, set of commands out of here and paste them in the body of our for loop. But I want to show you a nice little uh, shortcut here. If you have your for loop up here and you want to include some commands that are below it, if you just tap on this brace right here, the last brace, the final brace in your for loop, if you tap on that, you can actually hold it and drag it down, and uh, and it will sort of grab a hold of all the uh, all the commands you want to be inside the for loop. So that's a nice way to grab and capture those commands so that they're executed some number of times in our for loop. Okay. All right, and let's go ahead and try this out. Um, I'm just going to do a little practice one here first. I'm going to see if I set this number to be 2, what will happen if I only execute the for loop twice? I, just, I know this isn't going to complete the whole puzzle. I'm just going to practice here with my for i in 1 dot 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 2. I think that should execute the sequence 1, 2. So this set of commands in here from here to here will happen two times. Okay, well, let's run the code to see if that's the case. Okay, if we run it one time, it's going to clean up this, uh, this row. If we do it the second time, it's going to clean up this row. And then he should turn right and stop, I think. Excellent. Okay, just what we thought would happen. So to fix this, we're going to uh, select 4 here and have byte do the whole thing. I'm going to go ahead and run my code a little faster because I'm confident that this should solve the entire puzzle. There's one gem. He turns right. This is the second iteration of the for loop. He collects the gem. This is the third iteration of the for loop and the fourth iteration of the for loop. All right. So he did it four times uh, and he got all four gems. So Good work there. Uh, this is a good time to remind ourselves that uh, this is the for loop syntax. We say for i in some sequence, and we can start at any number we want here, and we can end at any number we want here. Uh, but the sequence will only be from the starting number uh, by 1 up to the ending number. Okay, And the commands we want to happen over and over and over are included inside these curly braces here, uh, this curly brace and this curly brace. Okay, and the other reminder is just again, this is an important chapter, we're learning about these for loops because they're very powerful, and we saw a little good example of this power in this uh, creating a weather forecast. Uh, so these things are being used uh, day in and day out to help guide your decisions on what to wear uh, on a certain day or, you know, where planes should fly safely uh, and uh, all kinds of things like that. So we'll see you next time.